Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Buds and Beads Sparkling and Loose Leaf Teas. My name is Norman Cook. Welcome to the Sober Awkward Podcast. Have you ever woken up on a Sunday morning and said, I'm never drinking again, and then found yourself waving 50 bucks at a barman by happy hour? Are you wondering why everyone else can stop at one while you head to a dodgy after party with a weird bloke called Disco Dave? If so, it might be time to take a deeper look at your relationship with your reliable social crutch, alcohol. On each episode, we'll investigate our own dysfunctional dealings with booze and find out if it's possible to stop this deeply ingrained habit before things get too messy. Yep, we're going to open up a shame shed of humiliating drinking stories to help you understand why waking up from a booze coma each weekend with a kebab sticking out of your top pocket might actually be negatively impacting your health. Hamish and I are here to delve into what it's like being sober, an unwanted warts and all look into why giving up those cheeky pints or putting down those mummy wines will make you feel happier, help your anxiety and mental health and turn you into the most sparkly, authentic version of you. Won't that mean I become boring though, Vic? Well, Hamish, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm Victoria Vanstone. I'm Hamish Adams-Cairns. And this is Sober Awkward. Fourteen years ago, Norman Cook, a.k.a. Fatboy Slim, checked himself into rehab and has been sober ever since. Following on from last week's episode on sober dancing, we wanted to sit down with the godfather of raving to hear his experiences of partying without alcohol. I hope he likes us calling him the godfather of raving. Yeah. We're not calling him the grandfather of raving. <laughs> yeah, We're calling him like, the OG, the, the godfather. OG, yeah. yeah. Norman was born in Bromley in July 1963. He grew up in Surrey to the sound of the Beatles playing in his family home, but it was his introduction to punk that really inspired him to break the rules when making music. Norman moved to Brighton to study for a degree and started mixing records at parties. It was during this time he realised the power of good tunes. After achieving success in the House Martins, Freak Power and Beats International, Norman decided to focus on his true passion of DJing. He produced dance music under various names until eventually becoming Fat Boy Slim. He became resident DJ at the Big Beat Boutique, which is somewhere I used to frequent Hamish every Friday night, and the soundtrack to many people's lives from there on in, including mine. Following the success of the club, he signed to Damien Harris's newly formed Skint Records as Fatboy Slim and released Santa Cruz, his first single. He subsequently became Big Beat's best known and most successful artist, turning Norman into an international superstar DJ. The single Praise You topped the UK chart in 1999, while his second album, You've Come a Long Way Baby, knocked Robbie Williams off the top spot. Since then, he has continued to rule dance floors across the world with funky breakbeats and catchy riffs. I sound like such a dork when I say that. No, funky breakbeats. Funky breakbeats break and so, catchy riffs. Something your mum would say. Like a nerd. <laughs> Norman has sold over 8 million albums worldwide and his new documentary, Right Here, Right Now, is out now. It tells the story of his iconic Big Beach Boutique 2 party on Brighton Beach in 2002, in which 250,000 people attended. It has been described as one of the biggest events the UK has ever seen. I was there, Hamish. Of course I was, stomping on the <laughs> dance floor. He describes himself as just a party fiend who nicks bits of other people's records. But he is much more than that to us and millions of people all over the world. Norman is nearly 60 and is proving that you can not only keep partying at his age, you can also do it sober. Norman said he doesn't want to be a spokesperson for sobriety. But we feel confident that his story of finding a sober life, despite his career and fame, will give hope to others that are scared of stepping into the sober world. Back down under for the first time since 2020, Cook is no stranger to Australia, a place that has embraced him early on in his career. We are privileged he talked to Vic, Lucy and I before his recent gig in Brisbane. Here's our interview with Norman Cook. (laughs) 
for me the awkward bit was only the first few months yeah just kind of readjusting it's just kind of yeah learning a different well there's tons of things you have to learn to do differently but I mean obviously for me it was really strange because my job is to entertain drunk people of course and for at first it was like how's this gonna work and and everyone around me was like how's it gonna work you being surrounded by drunk people all the time and I didn't know but it was kind of something I had to do and I had to face up to the fact that if that meant that I couldn't DJ anymore or couldn't do my job anymore, then so be it. You yeah. know, I was it's done. Really a make or break for you. It was, yeah. I mean, the first gig I did sober, I was really like, I was all those things that you hear about, you know, wanting to shit yourself, your knees turning to jelly, being stiff. I was like, all these physical manifestations of abject fear and horror about what might happen. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because there was a lot riding on it. Because I'd sort of made a decision that I was going to be sober, and and it was like, well, here's now we find out whether you've also got to make a big career change as well. Yeah, well, you're going to have to work at Sainsbury's for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, that was that was yeah. on the cards. That's not- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to be a fireman. Actually, that's another story. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, and and the first couple of gigs were kind of all right, but I was I was I was in the moment too much because well, most of the time when you're playing you want you you don't want to be you want to go with the it, well and actually cause you want to be in the moment that everybody else is having not in your own little private head mm. and and I found all these voices were just talking to me going so why do you want to play that record next <laughs> do you think they're going to like that and I'm like yeah they, they generally do so why are you going to play it next it's like, I don't know yeah I've it's just like got a level of awareness, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, and the thing is, you're, what you're doing when you're DJing is selling escapism, and it's like, there is no rhyme or reason to it. So at first, I was having this internal dialogue with my, the rest of myself, you know, it's going, <laughs> yeah. what are you doing? And they're just like, I don't know, let's just try it and see. It, it seems to be going all right. And then <laughs> all the while I'm doing this, I don't know what my face must have looked like. <laughs> Been watching me DJ, and instead of giving it all out, I'm just like, oh, 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 oh. talking oh. to yourself. Having a little conversation with myself. So it took a while to switch that. The, the, the thoughts and doubts off and just yeah. go you know what all you are all you're playing is a load of squelching noises but they're loving it and they <laughs> always did and you that's what you loved and it is just squelching noises but it turns people on yeah and um, and after about the fourth or the fifth gig I, I played this festival in Japan and Japanese people are just the most beautiful of audiences and they and they were and they were just having so much fun I was like that's what it is they you're just I'm just facilitating them to have the night of their life it doesn't involve me being the life and soul of the party i.e. as drunk as they are I can just be guiding them shepherding them in their night out and from then on it's like yeah no, I get it and then I stop doubting myself and just look, just go with it and and I kind of because I kind of I don't know whether it's I'm definitely not awkward on stage no no, I don't, exactly. definitely don't think, think there's sometimes if I play during daylight sometimes I look down at my legs and I think my god you are a 60 year old man <laughs> uh, but if, I, if it's in the dark I can maintain the illusion that I'm not a 60 year old man but uh, more importantly I kind of I, go, I get off on the fun that they're having yeah. but I'm doing it in a controlled way and I know what I'm doing and I'm pushing their buttons and, 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 and turning them on and facilitating them having a, and I have the great night, great night out because they're having a great night out. But when, when I finish playing, I can switch straight back into being normal and I, and I, yeah. go, I go to bed and Lovely. I wake up feeling with that moral higher ground <laughs> yeah. the next day of, yeah. of not feeling like Lovely, shit and not wondering what I did after the show, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and it works for me. I and mean, that was 14 years ago and, and my, DJing has gone from strength to strength and, right. and I see you know but I do but it's funny because sometimes you look at um, social media and the comments section and they go and someone will always go I thought he was supposed to be sober look at him he's off his nut <laughs> what's he, what's he on that, is, uh, that gives me the biggest buzz when I overhear someone go that guy's not even drinking look the way he dances <laughs> I'm like yes I'm finally really because you see head. that potentially could would make me feel awkward I think it is he <laughs> yeah. just is he just pretending but I because I'm there and I'm right in the thick of it I I think it's kind of it's um justifiable that I'm so overexcited about because I love my job and I'm in there with them and you know because I do get sort of intoxicated by it all yeah. but yeah. I think I might question if he was just somebody you know yeah. but then He's it's a yeah. it's just a fault in my character isn't yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah I think 
that if you can get your head into that kind of stuff I mean I always think that there's so much <laughs> drugs and alcohol still rattling around yeah, in there yeah, yeah, we exactly, just need yeah, something yeah. to set, rattle them loose <laughs> and they kind of all come out again we, both, we all felt that when we came we were just walking down through the park and hearing the music I was like oh god I think I'm gurning a bit like my <laughs> jaw started aching I was yeah, like, is, that, is that a thing called euphoric recall or is that just there's still a little shit there's a still little bit in there. you're yeah, bumping yeah, around in there <laughs> Do you still feel responsible for everybody? I know when I was a big drinker and a big party girl, I had this reputation that I took along everywhere with me, and I felt responsible for everybody in the room, like at the Big Beat Boutique when I used to come. I used to feel like it was my responsibility to make That's everybody funny, happy. That's I always thought it was my responsibility yeah, to make people happy. I was trying to get your the, job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only do if I'm playing. Okay, If I'm good. playing. Um, somebody... A, a very yeah. wise friend of mine who's a journalist once described me as a shepherd of moments and I thought that was wow, A, very cool. poetic but yeah. B, very apt because I, I, my job is to marshal people into having um, the best night of their lives and, and escaping and, and, and you know being free and, and unfettered to, to lose themselves but only when it's work I think yeah. if, if I just go to a party I can be quite not awkward, but I definitely don't want to be the life and soul of the party, especially if there's drunk people who are being the life and soul sure. of the party. Nothing I'm good. quite happy to, yeah. you know. And and then, and I'm sure you'll do the same thing where you stick around long enough until people start shouting in your ear, repeating themselves, <laughs> yeah, and then you just... Close. And then you make a quiet exit. No one ever notices you've gone. Yeah. So we talk about that a lot. It says the one thing also people have got in common is we're like masters at leaving a party without saying goodbye. Just slowly, it gets to that time. Usually about 10 o'clock, yeah. and then just the Yeah, and you know, you know when it's time to go. But, you also, but it took a while to realise that you don't have to say goodbye to everyone because A, they won't miss you and B, they won't care yeah. and C, they won't remember what time you went. They won't go, you went quite early last night. Yeah, they yeah. just go, what, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're caught up in their own anxiety, aren't yeah, they? they are. Yeah. I was quite into, I've got a question for you which is, it leads into what you were saying about, you know, you, you found out that even though you were sober, you were still a good DJ. My 17-year-old daughter went to the festival that you were just talking about and um, I said to her, who's playing? And she reeled off a few names. I hadn't heard of them. And then she said, Fat Boy Slim and I'm like what fat boy slim I didn't know you were into fat boy slim she said yeah me and my mates love fat boy slim and I was a little bit protective I was like you know he's a, he's our era he's not your era and, and and she went and she saw you and she was buzzing buzzing she saw you and she loved it and it made me realize how you've just covered the ages 20 plus years of playing to the people and playing to the people's kids and you've done it so brilliantly do you think you could have done it that well if you were off your rocker the whole time that's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that because I, it's a moot point about whether I'm a, actually a better DJ when I'm, when I'm drunk in the moment with everyone or whether I'm kind of cynically thinking, oh, you'll, you'll like this. And, you know, some people might say that it's kind of, it's not as, as effortless and natural as when you are having the party yeah. with them, that maybe it's slightly cynical. But I think I'd give a better show because I'm more on it. And, it. And, and it but it's more calculated. I'm literally... You're a better guide. But, I'm, yeah, I'm a better guide at shepherding them through the night out. Yeah. I've, I did 30 years of being in the night out, so I know what it involves. I think, for me, the most important thing is that, that I'm, I turned 60 this year and I'm still doing this. Yeah. I'm still getting away with it. Mm. I'm still physically capable of doing it. And that would not have been the case no. had I still been drinking. It was beginning to really hurt. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. and that was 14 years ago. So, look, yeah. you know. Yeah, the legs so, really would have looked awful, wouldn't they? Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, I would, I would have physically fallen apart and probably yeah. mentally as well. So, it's given me longevity. Yeah. And I think, I think I'm a better, I think I'm a better DJ. Yeah. For, I mean, sometimes I think it is, a, it is a little bit calculated, you know, because I am... Sometimes, I, you know, we've got this thing about me getting through the crowd. Um, sometimes I need to get to from A to B, which means crossing through the crowd. And they're like, oh, we'll get security. And it's like, no, don't worry. I'm best without security. I'll just flip through. Yeah. I said, because I'm way quicker than these zombies. Yeah. Yeah. I call them the zombies. Because <laughs> the thing, you walk past someone, by the time they recognize you, yeah. look, they've looked at you and they go, uh, 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 uh. I'm, I'm, I'm like 10 yards away by the time they worked out how to say to their mates, fuck me, it's fat boy Slim to just walk past. And you can you can run rings around drunk yeah, people, yeah. And, and people on drugs you can really run rings around them. Oh, yeah, we so, can that tonight, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. so um, 
Yeah, so it, and in a way, it's a, it's a little kind of cynical. But yeah, I mean, in the same way that I, was, I can run rings around people physically, I, you can outsmart them. I can push yeah. the buttons and, and, and what you do. hopefully, it's not yeah. It's about the performances. It's about making the music. You've surely got to get up in the morning and feel good. And, and you know, there's more than just the performances, yeah. isn't there? So you've got no to be switched on to, to do that. Yeah, yeah and, and, and also just the physical thing, because it's quite a... There's yeah. the travelling and the late nights and everything, they take its toll on a Yeah, we're struggling. We're usually better by that quite It's quite funny now at my age when some of my friends, like, I'm playing the town in the city they live in, they're like, do you want to come to the show? I'm like, yeah, 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 come along. Then. Like, yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, what's, what time are you on? I'm like, 2. 2 <laughs> a.m.? Uh, I'm like, yeah. They go, oh, we can't stay out. <laughs> We've been bed by 2 and you haven't even got on yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's yeah, it's it's an interesting lifestyle, and it and it and it can be quite hard work, and and physically and mentally, it's quite demanding. And I definitely mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to do that if I was still drinking. A lot of people email us saying they're sober now and don't know what to drink. You're fed up with juice. All the alcohol-free options are full of sugar, and like Vic, you're probably a bit over fizzy water. I certainly am. So we're so excited to tell you about our new partner, Buds and Beads. What a surprise! Two English people recommending you drink tea. I know. These are not any old teas, though, Hamish. No, these are an Australian first. Low sugar, bursting with nutrients, plus they are sparkling. Yes, I am so excited about this. Buds and Beads sparkling teas offer something a little sexy for celebrating life without the hangover. We are sex icons. We are sex icons. (laughs) And the good news is that we have an incredible discount for you, which is great because we know how tight Hamish is. Oh, that's not very kind. (laughs) Choose from the wickedly alluring ginger rose, a non-caffeinated herbal blend, or the rose vanilla scented silver needles, and before rain, a floral bouquet of orange, vanilla and jasmine. Oh, that's my favourite, Hamish. You know how I love a floral bouquet. I don't really know what that means. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Plus, if you try all three flavours, you can save 30 bucks and get your shipping free if you purchase them before the 7th of August. Yep, just head to budsandbeads.com.au and get your sober sparkle on. We often talk about the fact that when you're sober, the highs are a bit less high and the lows are definitely less low. But I heard you say recently that you've only started like crying with emotion on stage since going sober have you found it's more emotive performing sober than than back in the day it might be but I, it might have been more emotional but i don't remember, Can't remember. <laughs> yeah. um no i don't think it's emotional i think it was a different thing i mean i think when you're high you you, you you're high and you're like i am so fucking high i fucking love this i yeah. but i don't know if that's an emotion or just you're just high you know <laughs> mm-hmm. and the next day you can't really remember any specifics of the emotions apart from I was really fucking hot. Right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas now it's kind of there'll be a something a bit more spiritual mm. to if you have a if I have a really good night it's because something really beautiful has happened or I've really felt like we've all connected mm. or uh, and, and most of but the you know the the lows as well. I mean I, I went through a difficult divorce and mm-hmm. it's quite weird. Fe- the effect Feeling that the music would have because yeah. I'd always done that to other people and they'd yeah, been like yeah. uh, you could see people on a bit of a like, kind of like that kind of night yeah, out and you yeah, want to turn yeah. their turn their tears into joy or yeah. like I will survive you know yeah. and there are certain songs that I've been playing for years and all of a sudden oh, you know they're kind of like oh my god this is yeah. about yeah. <laughs> this is about what I'm going through right now and yeah. I'm supposed to be yeah. doing this to them and I'm doing mm-hmm. it to myself and yeah. yeah so I mean I mean music can be so emotive yeah. It can it can trigger so many emotions, but I think when I was high, I don't think it was so much emotion. I was just it was just ecstasy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> too many e's. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah, it was crazy looking back on it. I have a confession to make. Actually, I, I in your last gig at um, the old Concord, when it was just before it was knocked down, I you remember the. The VIP section, you went through that funny little door to the yeah. side. I unplugged the speakers and plugged in a industrial floor buffer that night and unplugged you from your final night at the concourse. So I had to apologise. Oh, uh, don't worry. I kind of figured that it was me cut through the cables. Because you, <laughs> you remember I was sore and everything. I do think you remember they, that. Because the manager said, he said, oh, will you come and play the last ever set before we demolish it? And I'm like, yeah, I said, if you demolish it, can I like take a piece of the dance floor? Because that was like our spiritual yes, hunt. Yeah. I said, can we take a piece of the dance floor home at the end of the night? He went, bring bring tools. He said, you can take wherever you want. It's going <laughs> to be knocked down tomorrow. That. So I turned up with a sledgehammer 
a saw and a jemmy <laughs> and I started taking bits and and the owners thought it was hilarious so we were so I was like kind of making a big thing and we smashed up the dressing room and we were taking bits of it out but there was a point during the set and there was there was a big pillar in the middle yes, of the stage there was yeah and I was just DJing with a saw like DJing with one hand <laughs> and sawing the pillar with the other yeah. and then the sound kind of came run, running out to me going no 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 stop 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 and I said I said no it's all right Chris said it was Chris. Chris I said Chris said it was all right he said to bring this out she said no no it's not that he said the power lines are in that <laughs> so oh, I, was actually I just you out. if anything had gone wrong I would have assumed it was me and my mates who were smashing oh, the whole place up I got so in big fear trouble not. I did get in big trouble by really the did I, you get a piece of the club at the no, end of the night I stole the floor the industrial floor buffer and I pulled it out of the front door and I went up Brighton seafront dragging this thing and the bouncers I don't remember the bouncers that all had plucked eyebrows they're all running after me going oh, Vicky come back you can't have that those were caught the me days. and dragged me back <laughs> those I got in were big the trouble days. yeah the did you go on. you didn't go to the power station afterwards did you oh I can't remember we all went back to mine I just moved down to Port Slade yes and someone said oh the power station's being blown up at dawn so we all <laughs> walked down you can imagine the state we, we all walked down to and watched them blow up the thing the power station the power station oh I do have some really fond memories of that time one of the questions that I wanted to ask was in sobriety we often say the saying like does it change you like do you feel inside that you are a different person or do you feel like the same person still do you still feel like Norman or do you feel like fat boy slim every day I know the difference between fat boy slim and Norman now yeah. because fat boy slim is this sort of uh, the show offy side of me that I just get out for work but back in the day I would take fat boy slim home with me because mm. I was I'd still be you know okay. drinking and then fat boy slim would attempt to be a dad the next day mm. work, not always yeah. the best yeah. thing to do Parents. and whereas now I can be as irresponsible as I like on stage because I know I don't take any of it home yeah. and so I think Norman is is Norman's just there all the time and Norman was always quite a, a nice bloke and you know he, he cared about others and he was fairly responsible but it was yeah it was taking fat boy Fat boy would come home with the uh, with the drink <laughs> and would yeah, sort of say his welcome. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, nowadays <laughs> I nowadays I put him back in his box the minute I come off stage. Mm. Yeah. It's like you know, yeah, take take the shirt off, put the shoes back yeah. on, and yeah. you know I'm normally good. But in those days, it would go on for days, yeah. and um, so yeah, I think I I, th I mean I think I'm a more com obviously a more complete and responsible and nicer person mm -hmm. um, without being. I'm probably not as funny as I used to be. Um, I mean, the worst thing about me was I was a really good drunk. Yeah. Like, really, yeah. really good. I, I never woke up in the wrong bed. <laughs> I never, I, you know, I always managed to get myself home. I never broke anything or lost anything. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very funny. Yeah. And that's why I got away with it for so long. When, yes. when it was beginning, you know, when the cracks were beginning to show with me, nobody around me was going, oh, you've got to sort yourself out because you're a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Everyone just thought I was really funny. I mean, they knew not to let me drive anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they like, yeah. So what were the cracks then for you? Uh, health. Right. I just felt sick and tired all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just obvious shakes. Just, I mean, I, I used to get the DT so bad in the mornings. Mm -hmm. And then if I had to do something that involved driving, I couldn't have a drink, and, you know. And so mm -hmm. the day went on, I'd be like that. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was wrong. Uh, and just my relationship with my... with, with Zoe gave up just before me and then she gave up like three weeks before me and those three weeks it was very apparent <laughs> that our, our relationship was untenable mm, with, sober. with her sober and me <laughs> drunk <laughs> but, yeah. or her trying to get sober and me still drunk yeah, yeah. and yeah and yeah it was just and when I mean when I went to rehab it was um, everybody was you know they you had you're writing out lists of the things you've lost and mm -hmm. people you've lost and I was I was really lucky because I you know I hadn't yet lost my job mm -hmm. my driving license my kids my, my partner but I think I was teetering on the edge mm -hmm. it was getting to that point and um, but I think yeah mainly mainly it was my mainly it was my health mm. just you know I was, I was 46 yeah. mm -hmm. 46 and I'd been drinking hard for 30 yeah. years yeah. And, and in my business you could do it you know you yeah. could someone would always drive you it was. It's always there. It's free. Well, I said we were setting out on the way down here. I thought, what 
other job could be more challenging to go sober than yeah. a DJ. Maybe yeah. like a, a pub landlord or a sommelier. Pretty yeah. much yeah. do what I could think of. Probably it's probably within yeah. in that top parent, three. Parent, yeah. Parents a shit job to have. But then, then we thought because um, we always think, oh, how do we get our buzz? How do we still get buzz without alcohol? And I heard your routine before going on stage is shoes off, Hawaiian shirt on, Red Bull, the three Red Bulls, and then yeah. three Red Bulls, yeah. and then slap in the face by Al, yeah. the tour manager. Well, the slap in the face re- re- um, replaced. The, my old little uh, sure. bump that used to get me yeah. fighting when I went on stage. Oh, yeah, is, he, so, is he a great slapper? Al is a fabulous slapper. And yeah. how hard are we He's talking? Are we talking like you come on with a red face? Yeah. So yeah, a lot of times you might notice there's a like yeah. yeah, I mean he gives me a proper thwack. It's a it's a very skilled <laughs> job that he's been doing a long time. Isn't it? Every now and then somebody else has a try. Yeah. And they but they always bottle it. Because you can just see him standing yeah. there going right how shall I do it and it's like yeah. he's just about to go on stage what if I fuck him up what if, you know, yeah. what if I give him a nosebleed or something do you want us to and have it, a go uh, no three? not really no <laughs> not particularly the last time I dared someone to do it they did it really hard oh, yeah. I told them that oh, I told no. them that and I think it was my nephew or something like it was somebody who you know oh, no. and they really cracked me up <laughs> but no Al can do it Al he's really he's really measured but you have to not get the ear because yeah. if you hit yeah. the ear it's got to be cheek though. so yeah. it's got to be just on the cheek it's always the same the side no just both uh, oh it's a double slap oh yeah I'd go on lopsided otherwise oh it's yeah. a good point yeah it's a double slap yeah. okay yeah you and I were only slappers back in the day weren't we in the drinking <laughs> yeah. days <laughs> yeah. you're still a bit of a slapper now yeah <laughs> but that is I mean that's a little bit of uh, it just replicates that you know that that, that, that kind of um, buzz yeah. yeah kind of a wake up before yeah. the show yeah I mean I'm sure if there's a little bit I don't know there's kind of it's that people who self harm and go, I just wanted to feel something. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Just it's a get, bit like that. It's just oh, gosh. But, but it just it just gets, gets my adrenaline going. Yeah. It helps me get into I get character. I a cup of tea now. Cup of tea rather than a slap in the face. Cup of really? Tea there, yeah. I'll slap you. You can slap me if you oh, want. I don't think we're going to bring no? that into the podcast. Okay. Image. I think that's going to be a bad You slap me. <laughs> you slap me has got less yeah, issues, I think, I think socially. I think that's a whole different episode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> slapping slapping episode. Yeah. Yeah. Al, for the purposes of the podcast, can you give me a slap? They want to know how hard you do it. Can you film it? This is I'm, a sci- I, I, scientific I want to get, get the audio so we get an idea of just how much of a whack you give it. Oh, excellent. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can turn please, it up. Hold on, let for me just get, please, oh, please don't hurt him. I'm a bit worried. Yeah. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hold on. Oh, 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 it is good. Oh, that is hit. good. Oh, it's always it's happy. He's really happy about it. Look. Yeah. Yeah. There's pen up anger. <laughs> There's pen up anger. If you're ever you late, showing anything. off for the cameras there. You need something out of that. <laughs> Scary. Well, we know you've got to run, so we don't, we don't right. want to keep you long. We have cool. to. Um, well, now I feel like I've got to go on stage. Yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> you're going to get the last, exactly. the last 30 seconds of this interview. He's going to be wired. I was, yeah, I don't know. I tell you what, I listened to a podcast with you this morning, and I thought you are, and this is a huge compliment, the vocal twin of John Motson. John Motson? Yeah, football commentator. You've Can you hear that, Al? There is, there is a John Motson you, tone in your voice. Do, you, do I sound like John Motson? No, you said it. Oh, I know, oh, no. I know. I couldn't believe it. My You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, do, I take that as a compliment. It thank is, you. It is. Well, Fabulous. Thank you. We just want to thank you so much, well, Norman, right. for coming on well, our little podcast. Well, thanks, it means thanks, thanks really for having me. And, and yeah, may your days never be so awkward. Wow. That was it. That was it. That was the highlight of our lives, that moment, wasn't it, Hamish? Liz told me that our life will forever be our life before interviewing Fat Boy Slim and our life after interviewing <laughs> yeah. Fat Boy Slim. <laughs> Not but when our children were born. Irrelevant. <laughs> Irrelevant now. Irrelevant bookmarks in our life. Yeah. We just need to do a massive shout out to my old mate, Andy Mack in Brighton, who somehow he used to blag me into the Big Boot Boutique years ago, Hamish, and he's still blagging me now, 25 years later. Thank you, Andy Mack, for sorting that out for us because it was an utter privilege and we just cannot believe that we managed to have Fat Boy Slim on our little sobriety (laughs) podcast. It's unbelievable. I didn't want to be excited all day. Like You told me the morning of that we got an interview and I capped my excitement. I didn't tell anyone because I thought something will go wrong. Like This is too good to be true and it went so much better than I thought it was going to go like he could not have been kinder we went in there before the gig he said oh come on in we'll have a chat for sort of I think half an hour 
And we left, I think we said on the last episode, we left our mics in there because we didn't want to be raving with them. And afterwards, oh, we'll just grab the mics. He said, oh, come back in, come back in to the Sober Crew and gave us another 35 minutes of just sort of hanging out. We didn't record that. But he was just such a wonderful guy, wasn't he? I kind of knew he would be and he yeah. did not disappoint. The thing is, I was a bit overexcited, so I was probably talking a bit too much. He probably thought I was a bit mad, but I don't really care. He was so <laughs> friendly. He didn't tell me I was mad, which was good. I think I was all over him like a rash. <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> yeah. He did describe our dancing as not awkward. Okay, well, that's good. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. I was a little bit awkward, but he was so friendly and kind to us. It was all hugs and kisses at the end, mm. wasn't it? I felt like I'd made a new mate. And it was nice to get Lucy in. It was like all the all the team back together, wasn't it? Was, it was, apart from Alan, the miserable bastard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it. he wasn't coming. <laughs> we also want to do a big shout out to Al, who was his tour manager. He was also extremely kind to us mm. and we couldn't have felt more welcomed into that environment even though we were nervous they were so accepting of us and friendly it just was amazing I can't, I can't quite get over it Hamish no it's surreal even listening back to it uh, we, don't, we, we never said that we would do interviews but I kind of feel like if you're going to break the rule for anyone Fat Boy Slim is the one. That was the one, wasn't it? Yeah. We broke all the sober, awkward rules and I'm so glad that we did. Yeah. I hope his story can inspire you. I always thought, God, if, if, if a superstar DJ who gets offered booze and drugs for free can give up alcohol, you can do it. Absolutely. What an inspiration. Thanks, Fat Boy Slim. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you're questioning your relationship with booze, you're struggling to moderate, or your hangovers are causing anxiety, it might be time to reach out for some support. Yeah, just talk to a mate about how you're feeling, contact a local doctor, find an AA or sobriety group. Fix got one. Yeah, just head to www.cuppa.community. Remember, if you're questioning yourself, it might be time to seek support. Even though this journey can be awkward, it is definitely worth it. And if you've enjoyed the Sober Awkward podcast, don't forget to review it, rate it and share it with your mates. Do they have to share it with their mates? Yeah, of course they do. I'm not doing this for nothing, Amish. Bloody hell. How do they share it?